to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. Now, I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Steady Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. And I'm excited about today's guest. It's Dr. Preston Ward. Now, he's double board certified in facial plastic surgery, as well as head and neck surgery. Dr. Ward lectures worldwide on his innovative techniques and serves on multiple committees for the American Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Now, Dr. Ward's in private practice with three offices in Salt Lake City, as well as Riverton, Utah, and specializes in rhinoplasty, revision rhino, facelift, blefs, and cosmetic injectables, as well as hair restoration. Now, he has his own private surgical facilities on site, as well as medical spas to cater to his non-surgical patients. Now, prior to his career in plastic surgery, Dr. Ward studied chemistry, and that prompted him to work with the leading cosmetic labs to develop his own skincare line that is commercially available through his office, as well as other medical spas in the region. Dr. Ward has a lovely wife, four grown children, two adorable dogs, and from the looks of it, he loves snow skiing. So Dr. Ward, welcome to Beauty in the Biz. It's a pleasure to have you. Well, it's great to be here and great to talk to you. I've um, I've loved listening to you over the years on the podium, and it's nice to talk to you over Zoom today. Thanks so much. So let me, um, first of all, um, let's talk about snow skiing just for a second. I used to snow ski a lot because I'm in Sausalito, California, and I'm only three and a half hours from Lake Tahoe, which is breathtakingly gorgeous. And I just right. haven't had the time like I used to. How far are you from the slopes? So I am, um, my house is seven miles from Snowbird. So um, it's really close. <laughs> now we have we have a we we frequently go up uh, north to another uh, place in Garden City, Utah, Bear Lake, Utah, which there's a, another place it's about 15 minutes from there. So um, yeah, skiing is is part of what you do if you live in Salt Lake. For sure. Um, so Dr. Ward, everybody would love to know how did you get from wherever you did after graduating, after medical school and fellowship and and, and all of that. How did you get to private practice? So what was your journey? I finished my fellowship at the University of Michigan and was fortunate enough to get a position at the University of Utah, which I loved. Um, I ended up leaving the University of Utah, though, um, due to just some changes. I, I would have, at the time when I left, I would have said, oh, it's because I'm concerned about the potential pay cuts that they're, they're making to our pay structure. But actually, it was a little bit more than that. It's like I realized that for me, I really like building things. It's not about finances. It's about building things and um, creating something that is kind of, I guess, bigger. Um, than, than what I am. And so that's what, why I decided to leave uh, the university. I'm still uh, a faculty member there, just not employed there. And I mean, there are some times when I kind of do miss the safety and security of employment, but it's so rewarding and it's so fun to be able to build something of your own, take care of your patients the way that you want to develop the practice that you want to do. Um, it's very rewarding. And um I could never, I'd have a really hard time going back to full employed just because it's so fun to be able to do what we want to do. And, and part of that is really kind of, is that vision, being able to have a vision and carry that vision out. For us, our niche is kind of really higher end um, services and it's about the experience. And that is something that I'm passionate about and that kind of gets me up in the morning. And did you start out with, I mean, you have a gorgeous place with an awful lot of staff you know, you have quite a little empire there right now, but how did you start out? Was it the wife at the phones <laughs> kind of thing? Or, you know? Kind of. I think we started with nine employees. Oh. Um, we did, we did take a, a business loan uh, to, to help with the, the funding for that. We don't have any other equity uh, partners, which something that just as a little aside, I, I think that a lot of physicians especially don't understand that, that certainly, you know, Borrowing money from a bank can be consumed very expensive, but borrowing money from equity partners is even more <laughs> expensive. That kind of confused me at first. So um, there's nothing wrong with getting a loan for the bank, especially with interest rates being what they are now. So we started out pretty small. Uh, we actually had a little bit of a personal tragedy right as we were opening. Our daughter was involved in an accident. Mm -hmm. And so the plan was for, the, for my wife to help a little bit more. And we kind of had to shift gears and change that because she was living in the hospital for a few months with, with our daughter. So um, that kind of shifted things, but we were just kind of full steam ahead. We'll just, we'll just try to get this done. And then we just kind of grew from there. And I, I have to confess, we have made 
every mistake that I can conceive of making. Um, and uh, some of those have been more painful than others, uh, but it's all about the learning. And, and the older I get, the more gray I get, the more I understand and appreciate those learning opportunities. And that's actually part of the fun is making those. I mean, nobody thinks making a mistake is fun, but learning from it and learning how to do it better really is part of the fun. Well, we can't leave it there. I was going to ask you later, but give us one big mistake that could help everybody else avoid if they're listening. Um, I mean, I, I, I've got so many, you know, which one to choose from, from this big menu. Um, for me, I think it's, it's kind of a, a lack of a, of an appreciation of culture of an organization, which if you read almost any business book, they're going to mention like, you know, culture is everything. And, um, I guess, I guess maybe the biggest mistake is, is maybe not realizing that culture starts with me. I, I you know, I, I don't mean this to be like a big, big mea culpa, um, um, uh, uh, spouting out, but but I think you know if you're a business owner, most of the problems they are all your problems, and oftentimes those problems do start with you. And uh, for me, it was kind of realizing you know a lot of our cultural problems were problems with me. Um, and it's not necessarily that I was a bad person or am a bad person or um, purposely made mistakes, but part of us, you know, the, the surgical training, the path that we go through, leads a lot of us to being you know, kind of injured in a way. And until you can kind of heal yourself and get yourself into a healthier state, it's hard for you to kind of be that sort of leader that you need to be where you can kind of set that culture. At least it was for me. I think a lot of people are naturally gifted at that. That's not one of the things that I was. And, and that has been a huge change is, to, is realizing that, that the business is going to run more efficiently. It's going to be more profitable. It's going to be more enjoyable for everybody. If I you know, in a way, kind of step back and take a little time to be selfish and take care of myself so that I'm in a better place and I can make better decisions and be a better uh, leader for our, our organization. So I guess to summarize all that, it would be the biggest mistake is is kind of not realizing that the problem starts with me and I need to fix me before I can expect to fix the other things that are going on in our business. I'll tell you, after hanging around with you surgeons for 22 years now, um, what I have learned is there's been such a mind shift that you have to make because for what, after 14 years, you had to become a surgeon. Now you have to become a leader and a manager, not even a manager. If you're a good leader, you find somebody to manage for you, but it all, all arrows point to you. And, and that's the good news and the bad news. You know, yeah, if, you can, if you can step up to that, um, everyone's looking to you and you're the role model and there's no more hiding in the surg surgical suite. <laughs> you know, you've got to um, show up and tell the staff, what, what do you want? You know, what is your vision? What is your mission? Where are we going with this? I've just found that the more clear you get about all of that and tell your staff, um, that's how the culture's developed, you know? Okay, team, here's where we're going. Just like in sports, you know? Anyway. No, it's, it reminds us so when I was, I did my residency and fellowship at the, at the University of Michigan, and I had several friends there who were getting graduate degrees in, they have a really big organizational behavior program. And I have to confess, I've told this to them, that I used to kind of um, be a little judgmental about their career choice. Like, that is like the softest, easiest field. Like, what are you talking about? Like, that is the... I, I, this is all going on in my head, you know, like, why are, why are these guys doing this? They you know, do something real like chemistry or, you know, I mean, that's kind of the judgmental side of me, I guess. And now what I realize, you know, whatever, 15, 20 years later is that those guys are actually the smart people because they realized early on how important it is to kind of make an organizational, you know, that it's really difficult to get an organization to behave the way that is going to make it profitable and healthy. And um, so I've had to kind of, you know, go back and um, and eat crow a little bit about my my judgmental state about that, because that is so important. And it's those softer, you know, quote unquote, softer things are actually the really difficult things to get right. And the older I get, the more I realize how important those are. And that's why I have this podcast, because it's the business side of surgery. If you don't get that then you probably shouldn't be in, in retail medicine because this is the fun side of medicine. Nobody needs to see you. They're going to hand you a credit card, not an insurance card, unless you get the business side of this down. Um, well, I guess you stay in reconstructive or you work in a hospital and let them handle the business side. But I'm talking about that. Are you still doing reconstructive or where's your percentages now? 
Yeah. So I, um, I love to do reconstructive stuff still. And so, yes, we, we still take insurance, um, which from a financial standpoint, you know, from a professional fee standpoint is, is not as good as cosmetic from a a facility fee side. Um, it's actually very good. Um, so financially it makes sense for us, but also from a, um, uh, a satisfaction standpoint it is just such a big part of my training and my background and my initial interest in, in, uh, reconst- in, in plastic surgery was reconstruction. So I definitely, uh, enjoy doing that and don't anticipate ever kind of stopping that. Okay. And then you have a, just an absolutely gorgeous office and, uh, you have your own surgical facilities. Um, right. Give us a few of the pros and cons of that, because that's no easy feat. Number one, getting approved, <laughs> you know, especially if you're doing a reconstructive, I guess you, you need a, you know, quad A or whatever. Um, right. Tell me a bit about doing that, because so many surgeons say to me, when is it time for me to get my own surgical suite? Like what's what's the risk and or what's the downside? Sure. So um, I did it initially for just because I wanted it to be convenient for me. Like I wanted a place just to operate where I was seeing patients. I could see patients there. Um, but it's, it, it, it really is from a business standpoint, it is a clear no brainer. If you are doing any sort of insurance cases to, um, to try to, to bring those to your surgical center. So the pros are, it can be very financially beneficial. Um, the downside is that it's a heck of a lot of work, um, to, to follow all the rules. We actually just had our Medicare accreditation survey this week, surprise, you know, surprise visit. And thankfully we were, we passed with flying colors. We felt really good about that. Um, I ended to, to, to help with that process. I actually took the course to become a surveyor. So I feel like I understand the rules better and can, can make sure that we're living them as well as following them. Um, so yeah, I would say that the pros are financial benefit. The, the, the downsides are it's a pain in the neck. Um, and, you know, part of it is the accreditation, but I would say the accreditation is the easy part. The, the hard part is actually just having the extra staff to look after, you know, because you're not, we're not big enough that we can hire like five scrub techs and uh, 12 nurses and, you know, all these different people to help. So if one person's out, you know, somebody's got COVID or somebody's sick or whatever, um, what do we do? You know, do we cancel two weeks to surgeries or, you know, how do we manage that? So it's really been an effort to try to, to get people cross-trained. And I think we're finally at a point that we are just getting to where we feel a little bit more comfortable with that. And, you know, next week there'll probably be some, be some other wrench thrown into our uh, plans, but, but it's, it's actually just the, the staffing thing, the, the logistics of getting staffing there and making sure that things run. It's, it's a lot more complicated than I think most of us as surgeons think. Although on the other hand, um, I, I saw a talk once at one of the meetings, and it was so interesting that the guy did a survey on working with a surgical staff that you don't know versus the one that you know really well. And you're like the well-oiled machine versus the clunky machine. And that was really interesting. Like it, it actually hit your bottom line pretty um, uh pretty like 5% or so of revenues was due to just being more efficient about it. Um, and another thought, uh, somebody had mentioned an app and I haven't checked it out, but there's this app for the uh, um, exact reason you're talking about. If someone's out, you're kind of screwed. And this yeah. app, you go on and say, I need a uh, scrub tech. Boom. And and uh, it's like an Uber for uh, hospital staff or surgical oh, staff. I need and, this app. <laughs> yeah. I think that's amazing because you, it happens all the time. And what do you do? Right. Yeah, what do you do? But no, you're right. And I think, you know, there's there's certainly some quantifiable um, uh, financial things that can happen by, you know, by having your own staff and stuff like that. You know, like you said, the 5% number. Um, but the other thing is just your own peace of mind. I mean, I remember actually one of the, the straws that broke my camel's back at the university was I was used to, to operating at a certain operating room. And due to staffing issues, now that I, I understand them a lot better now that I have my own, but due to staffing issues, the OR administration moved me from this out, nice little outpatient surgical center that's pretty small that, that kind of everybody knew my preferences to the big cancer center, which I which I operate at, but but now with like, like they're not used to doing, I think it was like a facelift and a blepharoplasty that, that they moved me to. And it was really stressful for me. Because I, you know, I, I was working with an assistant who wasn't used to working with me. They didn't have all the instruments that I was used to having. And although I don't think that it affected that patient's results, it certainly affected me. And I probably have a few more gray hairs here because of that. And those little things that try to, the, again, the older I get, the more I realize you need to, we need to take steps to make our life easier, happier, less stressful. And is for me anyway, maybe I'm just a little picky, but moving from a little tiny outpatient OR to the big OR where they weren't used to using it was 
really stressful to me. And I just didn't want to have that anymore. Oh, I, I hear you. And, and not, and no more commuting. I think the older I get, the easier I'm getting, I'm going to simplify my life if it kills me, period. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm going to get rid of the hassles as uh, every day. I'm just knocking them out because you, you, you get older and you just you want life easier. It can't be this difficult. <laughs> yeah, life is short. Enjoy it while you can. Right. right? <laughs> so um, I um, regarding the surgical suite, though, a lot of doctors say to me, so do I like how big do I go with this? Um, do I just have an OR suite, a small suite just for myself? Do I grow a two or three OR suite where I have other surgeons come in? Do you have any mm-hmm. tips on? how you handle that or? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think if you've got a group of people that are, that are there, um, that, that can, that are committed to operating there, um, then, you know, two or three rooms at the max is probably what I would do, but there is nothing wrong with one or two rooms. And if you look at the utilization of most operating rooms, you know, I remember that at the university, uh, the utilization of the operating rooms, which seems super busy was still only about 80%. Oh. Uh, with with like one room, you can be very creative with scheduling, you know, so you can do block time with like half day blocks, or you can even do like four or five hour blocks where you start at say maybe even as early as 5 a.m. Go, you know, go to like five to 10, 10 to three, three to eight. Um, and sometimes that's easier to, to get staffing that way. So being a little creative, like you don't have to do things the way that the big hospitals have done them forever. And that's one of the real advantages about being small is you can be nimble to make changes the way that are going to fit your schedule uh, the best. I will say this though, it is, I hate to pick on my own profession, but we as physicians are really difficult in terms of understanding business principles. I agree. Yeah, I bet you do. You know better than I do. Um, It is really tough. Like there are physicians will shoot themselves. It's what's the saying? Um, Cut off your nose to spite your face or something like, I can't remember the exact saying, but they will do that. Um, and if they, there, there's almost like this, like profit is kind of like a dirty word in medicine. And if, if, if other surgeons feel that you as, as someone who has a financial stake in an operating room, um, stands to benefit from, from their using the operating room, that is almost a stronger motivator than them. They, they may not be really happy that the big healthcare system in your area is making money off them going there, but they're a lot happier to give that money to the healthcare system than to you as an individual physician. And so it can be really difficult to, to do that. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I, the word of warning, the reason I say that is I would set up some sort of system in place where they really are tied to the OR. Before you invest $300,000 into building out a three-room OR and you're, you know, you've know you got these verbal promises from these other surgeons that they're going to c- come and operate there, I would... Um, get something to, to make sure that they're going to go there, whether you're financially tying them in or, or, or they're actually partners somehow in it, because otherwise you could be out a whole bunch of money and they're still taking their cases to the other hospital, which is tough to swallow. I've seen that so often. I, they say one thing, they do another. The surgeon is 10 million in <laughs> and trying to figure out how's he going to get this thing to operate. And um, you're absolutely right. You've got to get some commitment ahead of time. Um, but also don't just don't count. Surgeons do not work well together period. Um, I've even seen the offices where, um, you know, they're all ophthalmologists and there's one cosmetic facial plastic surgeon and they won't even help him, you know, and, and they all can profit from it. So um, I, I, that's, I would say go lightly, you know, I would, yeah. you could always grow down the road. Um, speaking of growing and scaling, because I think you have a nice little entrepreneurial mindset going there. You're very good at taking what you have and making the most of it. Um, I'm watching you as you've like grown the med spas. Um, you've added another facial plastic surgeon. You've added a PA. Um, how are you? What's your game plan? <laughs> you know? Well, um, you know, that changes. You know, there's, you know, in the business world, we talk, they, the, the, the term is pivoting, but um, it's kind of, you know, going down different trails or different forks. Um, we, um, we started off initially and had a ton of success. Um, you know, I left the university, started off and, our growth of the med spa, the aesthetic side of things was just phenomenal. Um, so I, I read this, this great book. Um, you've probably read it before. It's called blitz scaling. It's about, <laughs> it's about like, Hey, you know what you like when you scale, like the normal way to scale is to nail it and then scale it written actually by my good friend and neighbor, Paul Alstrom. So it's a wonderful book. Read that book first, yeah. nail it, then scale it. But before I read Paul's book, I read blitz scaling and blitz scaling essentially states like, Hey, listen, forget all about this traditional stuff grow your business, just grow it big. And then, you know, if you build it, they will come. And that's, that's certainly been true, but 
but that that carries with it some stress um, in the sense of you're, you're, you've, you've got these commitments that you've now made. You're in leases for buildings. You bought equipment that you're now paying for. And um, you're like, geez, I don't know if I really want to support that. And we, as we grew, grew into that, we had some success and then we had some COVID issues. We had another issue with, a, um, with we, we hired a plastic surgeon who just, it was not a good fit. And, um, and that kind of really hurt us. And that kind of comes back to the culture. And some of that is my fault. Some of that is just, it was just a bad fit. But um, with, with this kind of blitzkilling thing, we had this, this thing with the surgeon and then we COVID came. And so we've decided to use this opportunity to kind of change things up a little bit and really focus on what we think our core mission is. And, and for us, our, our core mission, we've decided is more along the, the stronger um, medical aesthetics realm, not, and what I mean by that is more along the, the surgical side of the spectrum and less along the day spa side of the spectrum. So for example, our spas used to offer massage. We don't offer massage anymore. We've cleaned out most of our makeup. We used to have a huge inventory of makeup items. We still have some, but we've cleaned that out for the most part. We do offer facials, but they're kind of a little bit more aggressive facials than what you'd see otherwise. It's like, it's, if you're going to get a facial here, it's going to be like a hydrofacial. It's not going to be, you know, kind of the touchy feely sort of one. And we've got partners that that we are working with to, to try to um, to because uh, we think those services are, are obviously still valuable, but they're just not our niche. You know, like we, you can't be everything to everybody. So part of this is our, our pivot has been a little bit on focus. And what we're currently doing is something that I'm really excited about is we are trying to create some. Um, mechanisms where we can partner with entrepreneurial aesthetics um, providers. So whether those are estheticians, whether they are um, injectors, where we will offer the space, we will offer the medical directorship, we'll offer the supplies for uh, for a, a fee that's a lot more affordable for these aesthetics providers, where they can partner with us to provide these services that we don't think that we are necessarily um, wanting to focus on primarily. And then we're going to allow them to do that. And that we, that's really satisfying to us because it allows us to focus on our real passion within aesthetics, which is that kind of like more surgical, heavier duty aesthetics thing. It also allows us to focus on sharing our passion for entrepreneurship and helping other people grow the businesses that they want to grow. Um, and so we're very excited about that. We're going to offer that in at least one of our locations. We've started it in one location and probably in another one, but we'll see how that goes. I love that idea. See, I knew you were entrepreneurial. Uh, I would just um, heads up on the person that you choose. I have watched other practices uh, try to control that person. And one of the issues is, here's the good part. Typically, they've been humbled. They've tried to run this on their own and they're like, I, I give up. I don't want to manage anybody. I want to inject. You know, that's all they want to do. So it's a perfect solution for them. However, when it comes time to marketing or branding, now all of a sudden it's them and you're not in the picture or like, who are they to you? You know, and it's confusing to the patients. But I would also say the goal is all arrows still lead to surgery. So if somebody's in their office and they're getting injectables, I would have in-house signage around. I would have your work Great idea. going off, you know, like on digital photo frames um, because everything goes to surgical after a while. So anyway, I think it's a fabulous idea though. Um, but now do you manage, give me some staff tips on managing because I would say, um, surgeons tell me, I would say that's their probably number one complaint is this darn staff business, you know, how to manage people, how to motivate them, um, how to stop being blindsided by them, you know, how to, how to stop the embezzlement, um, all of that. Do you have, I'm sure you have some of your own horror stories or some really good tips on what have you done to get a really good team surrounding you to support you? Yes. I, when I talk to surgeons, you know, there's a couple little chat groups that I'm part of that we, you know, complain to each other and this or that. And that is, that's, that's the majority of what, of what it is. Unfortunately, because what we're really passionate about is, you know, kind of our, our craft and learning that, but it's kind of sad we spend so much time talking about, about this. Um, the first thing I would say is what I already said is start with you. Um, realize, you know, it takes quite a bit of humility and, um, you know, spending time really thinking about ways that, that you're actually the cause of the problem. And that's that, like I said, it's, it's very humbling to go through that, but it's really inspiring too, to learn that you can overcome that and become better. And so I really liked that. Um, the other thing that I think is that <laughs> so many of the tasks that we do in business as physicians, if, if they're, if they're like me, we think like, Oh, I can just do that. I can, I can put that into QuickBooks. I can, I can just do the HR paperwork. I don't want to spend whatever $2,000 a month on this or that just spend the money. 
it is so worth it because those tasks build up and you don't have, you really just don't have time to do it. And it takes you away from the things that you love the most, whether that's surgery, whether that's your family, friends, skiing, you know, whatever it might be. So just spend the money to do that. And so that, that would be, you know, kind of the simple solution is we've, we've hired an HR company that handles all of our, um, you know, like the employment issue, like they verify, um, that they're eligible to work. They verify that we do like random drug testing. They, they make sure that that's handled, you know, all those sorts of things, they handle that. If there is ever an employee issue, which there always will be because people are people, you know, um, and that's not necessarily anything wrong. And when there are issues, it's not like that person is a bad person. It's just, it's just a misunderstanding. So, um, Having them to help with that and having them act as a mediator really helps where they can kind of help us better understand. And it removes a lot of the emotions because so many things with employees comes with emotion, both on, on your side as a business owner and on their side. And so it's only fair to kind of have somebody to help. Um, the other thing that is really key for me is getting the right support staff in terms of leadership in position. I think as physicians, again, I'll speak for myself but I think I'm probably like a lot of people. We think that we can do it all. And I know that I can't do it all. Um, You know, we have got a couple of, well, we've got four or five really amazing leaders. I'm going to mention a couple of them, Matt Walker, who is like our operations administrator. And he, he is just incredible in terms of how he can interpret data and then apply that to um, the clinical setting to make it work better. He he's good at, understanding the vision and how to integrate that into the practice. He works very closely with CJ Terramoto, who's a nursing director um, and um, operations uh, director. And he does the same thing, you know, really good at this, the simple things like how do we get the exam room? Why can't I, you know, I'd be really frustrated with this. And here's an example of bad behavior on my part. At the end of the day or, or three fourths through the day, I look and I see like, oh my gosh, like this, the drawer in the exam room that I need to examine this patient is empty. I know for sure that we've got like a hundred of these instruments. Where are they all? Why don't we stock them last night? I like my way of dealing with that is like to complain to everybody about it. And then they, then they feel, I make them feel bad, not intentionally, but I make them feel bad. Um, they're not very effective at their job. They're not motivated to do it. Whereas if I just tell CJ about it, he deals with it in a much more constructive way that doesn't make people feel like, like they're, you know, down or not doing a good job, um, which I just, whether it's time or personality, I just don't seem to have that skill set as naturally as what others do. Another really great leader that we have is Jared Longhurst, who is a um, phenomenal um, leader. He, he's actually got a marketing background, but the thing that Jared really um, thrives on is, is culture and helping people understand what we're part of and what we're working towards. And he's good at helping people feel good about that and helping them feel fulfilled at their job. That's what we say. We tell people, our our staff, we want you to wake up in the morning, excited to go to work, realizing it is called work. It's not called play, but you're going to go to work and you're going to feel inspired. You're going to feel uh, like you're productive at work. And then you're going to leave, go home to your family and feel fulfilled at the end of the day. And Jared really, you know, he, by working with Matt, he, he really does a good job with that. And then we've got an amazing sales manager who's um, Jace, Jace Rhodes. She does a, a wonderful job. And then our marketing director is Bree, who just really helps. And they all understand our vision and they all integrate it. They understand that complaints go up, not, not, not down, definitely, but definitely not even sideways. They always go up and then we work on, on fixing those. And that's been a really big uh, change for us. So that's getting those people in place that can do the job better. Because here's what used to happen is that I'd be walking from my office to the OR and they'd say, hey, Dr. Ward, um, so uh, is it okay if we do this or do that? And I, you know, I I spat off some answer off the top of my head without really thinking it through, just wanted to cross it off my to-do list. And um, it ends up not being the right decision. (laughs) So having those questions go to Matt, having those questions go to Jared um, has really changed things because I just need to focus on what I do. And my job really is to do the surgery and to provide that vision. Um, and that's what, that's what we try to do. Um, I, I hope everybody's hearing you. That's exactly how you run a business. You do what you're good at. You set the vision and the tone and the, you know, how we're going to act here, how we're going to roll. And yeah. then you hire your C-suite. So you've hired the right people. You have your COO, your CMO, and all of those people, and they are the mediator between you and the staff. 
and the public because everyone's got to love you. You can't be that tyrant anymore in today's world. Um, they they have to like everybody's got to like you, you know. And uh, so for you to be the bad guy, that's not the way to go. You have a whole team that surrounds you that handles all of that for you, and then you focus. I've seen so many times where the surgeon is is um, attacked in the hallway, and he's making these decisions on the fly. And sure enough, it either goes very sideways, and but then the staff says, "Well, you told me I could." Or you're like, what are you talking about? I didn't, I don't even remember this discussion. Um, and so, you know, yes. you just can't win with all of that. So you talk to our staff before that, because that's exactly what, what they would say about me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was going to ask you about the services you were offering because I was surprised that you were offering massage and a makeup counter. I, I that kind of threw me off because I thought. I don't think you can win this game being everything to everybody anymore. And um, there's so much um, P&L in each of your profit centers. And I'm sure that's what you did. You looked at that and said, what's the what's the hassle in this? The time involved, the staff involved. Is it worth it? And I'm assuming no. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it, and again, that takes somebody like Matt going through the numbers, looking through it and say like, hey, listen, you know, like we've got all this stuff and it's, you know, it's not necessarily losing money. It's not really making money, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's, it's actually, I'm sorry, directly making money or losing money, but it's indirectly losing money because we're doing inventory on this every month or we're, you know, having to restock it or, you know, this or that, is, is it, is it really worth it? And, and you're right. You can't be everything to everybody. Well, I think it can be a distraction too, because people forget to look at the opportunity costs of, not doing something or doing something. The more you're focused on this piddly stuff, the less you're focused on the bigger ticket items or the bigger profit centers. And um, so, you know, I, I'm so glad somebody looked at those numbers because I have not seen that work out well in pretty much anything. However, I would actually backtrack back to that plastic surgeon. I have seen that work remarkably well when there's a very big boundary. Neck up is you, neck down is a plastic surgeon. Like, you know, very, very thick lines there. And when you get the right one, um, I think it's a no brainer because I'm, I'm that cosmetic patient who needs, who needs everything. Uh, so I will keep coming back. I'm not dying to go shop around. If I love a place and I go there for my injectables and my facelift, and then I go back to a little light bulb, I mean, I'll go up and down this thing for decades. So I like that. You know, I would take a look at that because I think you, maybe you just had the wrong fit. But um, it's it, that works better than anything I've ever seen where you have two of the same, two facial plastics, two mm. plastic surgeons. I just think they're, you know, one plastic or one facial, one body seems anyway, that would be my two cents. If you're, if you're. I, I think that's great. Excellent advice. Um, so let's talk about marketing. Um, it's pretty darn competitive everywhere, but I'm assuming Utah is no different than anywhere else. How, right. how is how competitive is it there? Well, in 2013, I think it was, Forbes named uh, Utah the vainest state in the union, or maybe Salt Lake City the vainest city in the union, which, I mean, okay. Utah's a pretty conservative place overall. So they were a little surprised. They, they based that based on um, per capita plastic surgeons. There are more surgeons, plastic surgeons per capita than anywhere else in the country. Um, it's a really interesting place. It's almost like a combination between Texas and California. Um, in the sense of, you know, like they, they, each of those has maybe like a more familiar sort of stereotype associated with it, but it's kind of like that. Um, so it is pretty competitive. Uh, Utah is growing uh, pretty rapidly, which I, I think has been nice for us. Um, I think with the, with the last census numbers, percentage wise, it was the biggest percentage growth of any state. Um, so it, it is rapidly expanding. In terms of marketing, I mean, it's it's really you know, I think marketing is just a part of what we all do and trying to figure out how to how to use that spend wisely is what a lot of us as surgeons try to do. Um, what's our working? marketing, oh, sorry, go ahead. What's working? What, what marketing channels are working the best? So social media uh, works uh, the best for us. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with social media. Sometimes I'm really into it and I think it's fun. Sometimes it just seems like a, a terrible burden. Um, for me, it's been, um, I've tr I try to make our marketing about education. Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to do marketing based on education. And, and sometimes that's it. that's that can be a little bit uh, difficult um, in the sense of 
you, you look at your numbers, you're like, I, I, I spend, you know, 30 minutes putting together some posts where I explain like what I did to the cartilage of the nose and how we took the rib graft or did this or that. And I think it's just beautiful and really educational. And it gets like no interaction. Whereas I put a picture of my dog on and <laughs> the interaction is like through the roof. So I think your, dog, your dog hanging out the window of the car <laughs> is adorable. I will never forget that. So <laughs> I, I, well, I think so so that catches my attention. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, 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 I give a talk um, every few years um, at, at meetings and I'm asked to give about marketing. And um, one of the, the points that I try to make is we're all familiar with Julius Caesar. Um, Julius Caesar, you know, became famous as the um, as the general who kind of conquered Gaul or, or you know, continental Europe and France. Um, interestingly, there weren't any there wasn't anybody that told his story except for him. And that's one thing I think is really interesting is that he essentially made his name. Who knows what really happened? But the only thing that the Roman people knew about was what Julius Caesar was writing back and telling them that happened. And of course, you know, as surgeons, we want to be ethical and honest. We're not here to lie or tell, tell fibs. But on the other hand, there's not going to be anybody who's going to tell your story besides you. And social media has offered such an incredible opportunity for us to be able to do that where we can tell our story and we can tell about the things that we like, you know? So for example, for me, my, my um, aesthetic, if you will, is for very natural results. I think a lot of surgeons feel that way, but I'd rather have a nose that's maybe a little bit bigger than, than others. Um, Cause I think that looks better or um, you know, whatever it may be. And so who's going to tell that story except for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and social media really allows us to do that. And so that's, that's maybe the word of advice that I would give to surgeons is, is I know, I realize, I understand you hate social media. It's a pain in the neck. I was actually just part of this chat group the other day and somebody said, I'm so sick of Instagram, I'm done, <laughs> you know? And, but that's really the only opportunity that we have to, to tell our story and tell about the, the, explain our vision to to our client base, which is kind of what we need to do. So I think that's a huge part of marketing for me. Well, you're doing a good job. You've got like 46,000 Follower, so good for you. Um, you know why? You know why you can't dismiss social media because the patients love it, and you've got to be where the patients are. So if you want to play the game, you've got to be on the field. And Instagram is here to stay. I'll take Instagram any day over TikTok. Um, I'm I'm writing a blog right now. Do I need to be on TikTok as a surgeon? And so far, I'm going to say I'm what it doesn't matter. I'll tell you later. Um, but um, the it, it it's worth the time. But the smart part is. How do you figure out how to put the time in? Because I know you want to do education and that, and people love that, but they love the personality side. Right. We women, especially, we want to know who's the man behind the mask. You know, yeah. who is, who is this surgeon? Is he, who is he? Um, does yeah. he like cook? Maybe not dance, but you know, he likes to snow ski. He's got these dogs that hang out the window that are adorable. He's got a lovely wife and all the kids. And um, that's what we want. And that's what the patients are doing. They're they're literally going to Instagram. They're seeing you and going, oh, who's that? And then they're watching, watching, watching. Oh, uh, oh okay, that's interesting. And then they eventually get to your website. Or a girlfriend has mentioned you. And typically, they literally will almost go to social media before they're going to go to your website. Because for social, they're still like just looking around for, I think when they get to your, their web, your website, they're a lot more serious about getting right. to that point. Um, right. You know, so I think you have to, you have to work, work it out. Do you have a support team? Do you have somebody following you around with the iPad? Um, do you have who's editing the videos? How much time are you spending on this versus your team? Yeah, so I, I think you're right. I think that that personality is actually one of the most important things. And just before I really answer your question, I just something you said kind of piqued my interest. Just th- just this week, I did a little poll on an Instagram story, and I said, "Hey, what do you want to see more of in 2022?" And I did like educational content, before and afters, personal stories, or something else. I think, and by far the winner was personal stories. It's so, I mean, it's just so interesting to me, but um, so I think there does need to be some personality that comes through in terms of, um, you know, who does it? We, we do, we do have somebody that helps with marketing. Um, so for example, if I'm in the, in the middle of clinic and I, and I see a patient who, who is happy to talk about their experience, I can say, we, we just have her go in and she just talk, talks to the patient and, you know, finds out what kind of what we can do. We, we do a pretty good job of trying to ask patients if we can use their before and afters. Cause we're, you know, where I do face, it's not like it's a, you know, an abdomen or whatever, that's not 
recognizable. It's, it's you, your face is you. So we try to be very thoughtful about that. If, if somebody, you know, is worried about their identity being out there, not, not using that. So we are usually pretty open just about asking them. Mm-hmm. Um, ideally, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of kind of a, a change right now. We had a really great social media um, manager who, who en- ended up leaving. Um, but we're trying to get, get one for each of our accounts, one for the skincare account, one for the, for the derm spas, and then one for me itself, where we have someone who's, who's taking the video, who's getting the content, but it really does have to be with the search. I'm sorry to say, I wish I had an answer for, you know, all your listeners and said, Hey, you guys can just, you know, hire somebody and, and pay them. And they'll take care of it. They just can't because because they're not you. And um, so even though I don't necessarily answer all the comments or the, you know, do the likes or whatever, um, that really does need to, we, we try to do it in my voice so that it is um, uh, captured as my personality. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a way of collecting the data? Do you have any idea how much money comes out of the social media? Because one of the biggest issues is how do you track this? How do you know that you're spending this time wisely? Is it really, is it really creating new surgeries or new patients? Do you know? Yeah, I mean, without question, it is probably about. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but probably about fifty percent of our patients um, are from social media, and I do think there is something. You know, I, I used to would have maybe thought this was, um, I don't know, it's kind of nonsense, but there really is. Like the, the older I get, the more I realize that there definitely is a different aesthetic between surgeons, especially with the face. Mm-hmm. You know, so for example, it, the the nose that I do um, has a particular look to it, and I and I see some other you know surgeons around that I see their their noses, and they have a particular look to it, mm-hmm. and um, people see that on on social media and they share it and they talk about it, and so we about forty percent of our patients are in state, the rest are out of state, um, mm-hmm. and it's because they they see it on social media. So that really is that you know that megaphone of social media allows you to now reach across state lines. Whereas before, you know, it's just like you, you put up a billboard and there's 5 million people who drive by it every day, but who knows how many people are actually interested in, in getting a rhinoplasty. Yeah. Have you also noticed the patient demographics changing? Um, I'm, I'm, it seems like they're getting younger. Um, what do you think? For, for noses, uh, no, that, that hasn't been my experience. Um, I, I've actually seen an, an interesting trend. I don't know if it's this coincidence or, or what, but, but there seems to be people who, you know, like in their like 50s, 60s who may, you kind of think like, well, if their nose bothered them, they would come in and get it done before then. Like, oh yeah, this bump's always bothered me. I'm, I'm retired now. I've decided to get it done. But the actual reverse has happened with facial rejuvenation, mm-hmm. where I am seeing more and more younger patients mm-hmm. coming in, you know, people in their 30s or 40s, who I would have just turned away before, who are wanting something done for facial rejuvenation. I think it's just because they now recognize that there is some power to, you know, filler, jawline reshaping, that sort of thing. And with, um, and they, but they do realize that eventually there's only so much that they can do. And, you know, before, if you keep adding filler to your cheeks, you've got this big wide face that nobody likes. And so they maybe want like some facial contouring, which for me, my, my, my facial contouring technique is buckle fat removal, facial liposuction, really just try to make the cheekbones stand out more, the jawline stand out more. And, um, and, and with that, the, um, as, as a result, there's patients who are, who are seeking that. And, but then there's also patients who are just very excited about, they just actually just want like a mini lift or a facelift, even though they're, you know, 36 or whatever, they realize that if I just reposition this tissue up here, it's going to look better. And they don't want to wait till they're 72 years old and they're all wrinkly to do it where there's a big change. They want to maintain that look. So nose, I've actually seen a little bit of an increase in the age, but facial rejuvenation, the opposite, younger. I'm actually one of those nose patients. I didn't even, my, my nose never bothered me ever. And I think it's because the, the bump was on the side and I don't look at my side. And um, right. when I was in my early fifties and actually a plastic surgeon friend of mine said, <laughs> you don't need a facelift, you need a nose job. And I thought, how dare you? And sure enough, I had a nose job done like, you know, the next month and I love it. It softened my whole look, but who knew, you know, I, I completely agree. The nose, the rhinoplasties are, you know, the aging nose, maybe we should call it the aging nose and the aging, the aging nose. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk about how you're collecting reviews. You're doing a very good job with reviews. I'll tell you what, you're doing all the right things. 
your um, whatever you're doing with the reviews and you have a photo room. So you, you know, before and after photos are essential. We women, we people, we patients love to see the results of other people. Um, right. so you have that photo room. How are you doing the reviews? How are you collecting them? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So first of all, it's the photo room. I am a big pet peeve of mine is, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about social media mm-hmm. is social media. I think patients don't realize how manipulating, how, how manipulative, manipulative the photos can be, mm-hmm. you know, changing the angle, changing the head position, just a little bit, changing the lighting. I mean, I can, I can, I can give somebody a facelift just with lighting and head position. <laughs> and that's just a pet peeve of mine that is, I think it's just not ethical and not, and not honest if you don't do it proper. So we have a photographer who, I mean, he is a real photographer. He's, you know, he's not here. He's out in like the mountains capturing these amazing photos. He's, he's really incredible. But um, in terms of the reviews, we do a couple of things. Number one is it's really cheap to invest in. And a lot of our EMRs already have this as part of it, um, a review collection thing where you can send out a text or an email to request it. The thing that's been best for us though, is that we just get kind of staff excited about it. And, and so it might be, um, we used to, we haven't done this for a while, but we used to do something for about a year or so we did it where um, they got extra, the way that we kind of provide some incentives for staff is, you know, the name of our spots form Durham spa. So they would get form bucks for certain things. And every month, part of their bonus to get extra form bucks was um, if they got, a certain, if we got a certain number of reviews, so it was like a team reward, you know, and it wasn't really high. It's like, oh, if we get two reviews this month or five reviews this month, whatever the number was, then everybody gets these form bucks, which essentially a form buck allows you to buy roughly like 20 or 30 units of Botox. Um, so they can just get that on that, on the business. Um, so that, re- that really helped, but even more than that, um, I, I just love this concept. You know, a lot of us are familiar with the research of BF Skinner, who did like a lot of this psychological testing with intermittent rewards and intermittent stuff with, with rats and humans. Yeah. If we go to this, if we do this, this, um, if I go on the beginning of a clinic day and I say, Hey, Hey team, let's in our huddle. Um, let's see if we can get, let's ask a hundred percent of our patients for reviews and let's see if of those hundred percent, if we can get five. There's no reward. There's no incentive. It's just like that inner, I don't know what it is, but us as humans, we like that, but we need to be reminded of it. So if we do little things like that, that has actually been the most successful thing that we've done. And that reminds me, we haven't done that for, for a few months. So we better, we ought to get back on the train and start doing it again. Um, you know what I would suggest um, that has also worked well, rather than have it at that open thing or the entitlement thing, I would have a drive. You know, like, let's say um, you have this annual new patient drive and for one month or one week or whatever, you focus on word of mouth referrals. Um, Another time there's a drive, like, let's say during the summer when it's slow, you focus on, I don't know, social proof, you know, getting more before and after photos, testimonials, video testimonials. Um, Then it becomes this event in your office where people are focused on it. Um, But there also has to be a good carrot involved in that. Right. I love that idea because I think that it's so hard for us to maintain our focus as human beings. That gives us a chance to do it. Well, I, I, I honestly, I'm not even married. I don't have children. I have no excuses. I have a dog that I keep alive and well and happy, but I don't know how everyone's doing it. With all the information coming at us in today's world, um, I'm trying to keep up because I love learning and growing and I am struggling to, it's, it's just a fire hose 24 seven. And I, I don't know how everyone's doing it. I just think it's really, it's really difficult to get somebody's attention in today's world um, for more than a nanosecond. And then you need it long enough for them to not only notice you, but you've got to get them to that point where they literally trust you with their face and body. And now they're, they trust you so much. They're actually willing to call or text or email. Then they're actually willing to come in and give you money and have it done that's there. That is a monumental task. And I, I commend you for doing a good job with that. Well, thank you. Sure. So um, how did you learn the business and marketing side of plastic surgery? Because uh, you seem to have it down. Um, well, I, I don't know if I have, if, if I, you, you never learned this, right? It's a, it's a constant process. I read a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm a huge audible fan when I'm out with the dogs, when I'm working out or whatever, that's kind of probably what I'm listening to is some book. And I, I listen to it at like three X speed. So I can get through a lot fast. <laughs> I think a lot of us do that. Um, but that's probably the big, biggest thing for me is just like learning from the people who like, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm just learning from what 
other people have already learned. For sure. Um, do you have a one big tip, a tip, a few tips uh, that you would like to share? That's really um, you up level. Uh, for, for marketing specifically, you mean? Um, just for growing a practice, growing a cosmetic practice in the world today. What's what's something that works well? What good tip for that? Um, I think for 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 me. It is, um, this sounds so soft that it's, it's hard for me to, to even say it, I guess, out loud or put into words, but try to be, just be yourself and enjoy it. Um, because, you know, so many of us get into, into medicine because we like talking to people. We enjoy being around them. We like talking to them. Um, but over the years, it gets beat out of us. You know, we're, we're stressed out. We're running from patient to patient. We don't have time to talk to this one or that one, or these five patients are waiting, hurry up. Um, but just learning to enjoy even the patients that maybe aren't that, that, that you dread talking to the most in the sense of, cause maybe they're not thrilled with their result, or maybe there's some, I don't, you know, whatever it might be that that's, you're kind of dreading going to that room. But for me, if I can kind of get myself into a point where um, I'm excited to go in there and just talk to them as a human being and try to be a friend. And for me, a big part of that has been, been not trying to be anybody different than myself. I just go in and, I'm not going to try to mislead them. If, if they've got a result that, that I'm not thrilled about, um, I'll, I, I tell them, um, which I think sometimes backfires. Cause then they're like, well, is there something like, am I deformed? Am I ugly? And, you know, so you have to kind of figure out the right way to do it. But, um, but then, I'll, you know, the converse is true too. If I think they look great, I'll tell them that, they, that I think they look great. And um, that's just made things so much more enjoyable to me. And, and uh, it's kind of one of those things that I find that the more I enjoy doing it, the more successful and profitable it is. The other thing I, I will say just really quickly is um, one of the, one of my favorite books, which I know um, he, he's a little controversial. Uh, the, uh, Dave Ramsey, you know, he's like the extreme saving budgeting guy, which I don't think necessarily works for a lot of us. But by the way, but um, he's got this really interesting book called Entree Leadership. It's combining like entrepreneurship with leadership, mm-hmm. and. That in that book, there's a whole bunch of great tips on how to run a business that I think is really easily digestible for a lot of us as surgeons. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that he said in that book that his that I cannot get out of my head is that running a business is about two things, and they both start with P. It's about people and profit. Mm-hmm. If you're not profitable, you're not going to be in business for very long, and you're not going to be able to take care of your people, which is the next part. The people, of course, are your customers, but even more importantly, is the people that work where you, where you work. So your team members. And that's really that, that shift for me is like, I had to learn like, okay, I'm a person too. I need to take care of myself. And then I can take care of my team members, those people. And then as a group, me and our team members, we can take care of our people who are our patients and our clients. And that's been a really huge part for me. So those are the, the really quick, succinct tips that I would say to grow practices, people and profits are the only two things you need to worry about. Um, my tip is when I'm consulting, if you would please shift your your um, interpretation of staff. Staff are an asset to you, not a liability, not an overhead expense. And you don't know that until you lose a really good one. And then you realize, oh, crap, I should have, I should have paid more attention. I should never have let her go. Um, if you could shift that part, because I think surgeons have a tendency to think, whatever, who cares? I mean, I, it's front desk. Well, who cares? I'll get another one. Um, it's right. Especially right now it's not easy to get another one. Uh, right. And it's also just like, you can't just like throw money at them. I think a lot of times some mistakes that we as doctors make like, Oh, I'll just bump up their pay. Yeah. And you keep bumping their pay up every time that their little thing makes them unhappy. And that helps for a while, but it's really not about their pay. You know, um, um, the Zappos guy, Tony was, was really good about talking about that. You know, there's a great book by Daniel Pink called drive. Mm -hmm. Like pay is not what drives us. Mm -hmm. It's important. Like you have to pay your people appropriately, but that is not the thing. It's fulfillment at work and feeling like they're doing a good job. And that's what I think a lot of times we, as physicians, we just like, Oh, let me just try to check for this or I'll bump up your money. And then before you know, you're paying a hundred dollars an hour to, to every nurse that you have, and you're not going to be profitable at that point. Well, and that's old school thinking. And frankly, I'm from that world. Like I'm, I'm paying you, I'm paying you to do your job, just do your job. Um, that's not going to fly anymore. And that's where the culture thing comes in. And, uh, you know, honestly, um, people want to be appreciated and acknowledged. And um, 
and I don't know what it is. I think um, it makes some of us feel vulnerable. Like if I acknowledge them, they're going to ask me for more money. Um, or if I pat them on the head every day, it's like, really, do I really have to do that? Because I came from a different work ethic. Um, but that's, you know, you have to go with the times and adapt. And um, uh, staff today really are different than before. So it's just another complexity to add to our list of things to do to learn. Right. <laughs> so, um, just to wrap it up, can you give us one thing that's pretty interesting about you that we don't know? Oh gosh, I'm I'm pretty boring. Um, yeah, me too. <laughs> um, God, one interesting thing. Gosh, Catherine, you put me on the spot here. <laughs> um, okay, here's something. I I am I am currently um, I'm wrapping up my um a tour of presidential biographies so i'm a little bit of an amateur historian oh. with most of my, with most of my um reading that's not business being spent on presidential history which has been a really cool way to to actually learn about the present like it's crazy how you know like last week was or yesterday was january 6th and um you know that was kind of a big day there's been other days just like that that are equally crazy when you read about it and we just don't know about it. So it's been a kind of a cool way for me to kind of, I guess, better calm down about the present situation um, in, in the world by better understanding the past. Very nice. That's interesting. I never would have guessed that. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward, for um, being on Beauty and the Biz. I really, really appreciate it. And how could somebody, if they wanted to get a hold of you, what would be the, I know your website is wardmd.com. Is there any other way to get a hold of you? Yeah, so I'm on Instagram at, at WardMD. Um, uh, if you want to email me, uh, doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R, at WardMD.com. Gotcha. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'll be watching your growth, and hopefully I'll see you at another conference someday. Yeah. Right. Someday. We got to get back at it. Thank you very much. Take care.